We're going to be in John chapter 15 in a little bit if you want to turn. John chapter 15. A guy by the name of Gary Chapman is famous for writing a book entitled The Five Love Languages. Um, basically, his premise is this. We as humans have five different ways that we communicate love with one another. Um, five different ways that we speak and show concern, whether it's to our spouse or to our kids or to our friends. So I'm going to run you through what he calls the five love languages, and then we'll circle back to them at the end. I don't remember what order I had the pictures in, so I'm just going to have Eric start. Show me that first picture there. So the first one is what's called quality time, that we show love by spending time with one another. Um, going out to dinner together, playing games together, fishing together, going on a boat ride together, hiking together, making memories together. That one of the ways we communicate love is that we like to spend time together. The next one is what's called acts of service. That we show love by serving one another. Now this could be carrying groceries for your grandma at the grocery store. It could be doing the chore that your spouse normally does. She always washes the dishes, but tonight I'm going to wash the dishes to show her that I care about her. It could be cleaning the room. It could be cleaning out their car. It's an act of service. Uh, the third love language is what he calls physical touch. Um, there's a lot of medical research out now. Do you know that a 15-second hug can actually lower your blood pressure, lower your heart rate, and releases oxytocin into your body, fighting anxiety and depression? Our bodies are hardwired to receive physical affection from people. And there are some for whom what they need is someone to put their arm around them, to give them a hug, to pat them on the back, to say it's going to be okay. We communicate love through physical touch. The fourth one is um, gift giving. Anybody have a grandma who just goes overboard at Christmas? Like there's just mountains of gifts. Yeah, it just piles and piles of gifts. This might be you if, if you're the kind of person who comes home with a, a box of chocolates for your wife once a week, or flowers on a regular basis, or you pick up little toys for your kids, that you give gifts as a way of saying, I care about you. And so that's number four. Number five is what's called words of affirmation. You are amazing. You are brave. You are strong. You are the world's best preacher, and we're so lucky to have you. Oh, wait. Sorry. I get a little sidetracked sometimes. Um, they are the words of encouragement that you speak to one another. And so Gary Chapman has this collection of books that have been redone, and there's the five love languages for marriages, and the five love languages for kids, and the five love languages for grandkids, and the five love languages for your pet hamster, and the five love languages for your potato garden, and I made some of those up. But the idea is these are the five basic ways that when we as humans want to say to someone else, I care about you, whether it is our friend or it is our child or it is our parent or it is our spouse, we communicate love through words of affirmation, physical touch, the giving of gifts, um, quality time, and acts of service. That's how we say to someone else, I love you. And I bring that up because today we're going to read this text in John 15 where Jesus says, let me show you how I communicate love. Let me show you what love really looks like. This is John 15, starting in verse 12. He says, This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I'm going to just read that again. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do what I command you. We're going to take the next three weeks and kind of unpack John 15 a little bit. We've called our sermon series Greater Love. There is no greater love than this, that you would lay down your life for your friends. That's John's statement in John 15, 13. Now, in the grand context of this, he's actually speaking to his disciples about how they should love one another. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But the example he uses for them is his own love for his disciples. He says, if you want to know what real love looks like, follow my model. And my model is, I'm about to lay down my life for my friends. And no greater love has any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. 
And that's something that's kind of like inherent in our brains, right? Like we know that subconsciously. It's a reason we look at folks who risk their life for other people as heroes. It's the reason the firefighter who goes rushing into the fire at peril of his own life to save somebody he's never met before and drag them out is a hero. That we look at him and go, that guy, he, just, he was willing to die for that family. That is incredible. It's the reason we speak of our soldiers in such high regard that they would go into combat, that they would risk their own life for people they've never met before and probably will never meet, and that they're willing to pay that price for other people. We hold them in high esteem because that, from a human perspective, that is as much courage and bravery and true, unconditional love that you can show. I am willing to die for these people that I've never met. I love them that much, I think what we're doing here is so important that I will exchange my life for theirs if it's necessary. And so we put them on the highest of pedestals that human beings can go on. At risk of sounding unappreciative, and I'm not in any way, I just want to point out one distinct difference. And it's, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. People... We're so desperate for analogies and illustrations that we try to make comparisons to what Jesus did on the cross. And every human comparison comes down to one of two things. Either one, it was a decision made in a moment. A mother sees her kid in a fire and trades her life for his because there's this instinctual, I have to do this, he's not going to make it otherwise. Or two, it's just an issue of risk. I have friends who are firefighters and soldiers, and I just I think the world of them. But I promise you, when my firefighter friend goes running into a fire, his plan is not to be dead. He knows it's a possibility. He knows it could happen, but that's not his plan. He doesn't go in to rescue the family thinking, you know what, I, I think I'll just I'll die this time. The plan going in is, I'm going to bring them out, and I'm coming out too. Now, he knows every time he goes in that that could happen to him, but that's not his plan. The same is true of our soldiers. They are well aware of the risk. They're well aware of the price they could pay, but none of them ever plans to not come home. And yet when we read about Jesus, we read verses like John chapter 10, verse 18. No one will take my life from me, but I will lay it down on my own, and I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up. I have received this command from my Father. Or Revelation 13, 8. For Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Or Matthew 26, 53. When they've come to arrest Jesus and his, his disciples pull out a sword to defend him. And Jesus says this. He says, don't you think that I can call on my Father and he will provide me at once with more than 12 legions of angels? You see, when the Bible talks about Jesus' sacrifice, the story doesn't go like this. Jesus came to earth, he was born, he lived a good life, and the plan was he was going to preach good sermons, convince people to follow God, and they were going to set him up on a throne, and he was going to reign forever. That was the plan, and then things got a little out of control. You know, the Romans were more powerful than he planned on, and the Jews got a little more upset than he thought they would, and he didn't plan this thing, and it just kind of, things spiraled out of control, and he died, and that wasn't really, that's not how the Bible talks about the death of Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. That means that before Mary ever conceived, the cross was in view. Before Isaiah ever wrote the words of the suffering servant by whose stripes we would be healed, the cross was already in view. Before God ever spoke to David through the prophet Nathan and said, David, I'm going to build you a house that will last forever. One day your son will be a king who will reign forever and ever. Before the promise was ever made, the cross was in view. Before Moses ever led the Israelites out of Egypt, and gave them these directions on how to slaughter a Passover lamb. And how the blood of the lamb would protect them from death and the lamb would die in their place. Before the Passover ever happened, the cross was in view. 
Before God ever spoke to Abraham as he looked at the stars in the sky and said, Abraham, someday through your family, I'm going to bless the whole world. God knew that blessing would come through the cross. Before Noah, before Cain and Abel, before Adam and Eve, before God said, let there be light, before the beginning, the cross was in view. This was not a momentary decision. This wasn't a panic move. This wasn't things getting out of hand. This was the plan from the very beginning. For Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And as the story begins to unfold, we need to keep in mind that this is not Jesus risking his life. This is Jesus laying his life down. At any moment that he decides to stop the story, he snaps his fingers and legions of angels appear. I don't know if you know your Old Testament well, but there was one angel who appeared in the book of 2 Kings, and he slaughtered 120,000 Assyrians. I imagine 12 legions of angels could have handled the mob at the cross. But Jesus didn't do that because this was his plan from the very beginning. And so when they come to the garden and they arrest him, And this mob with torches and angry people and his best, one of his best friends kisses him on the cheek and betrays him to the authority. You need to know Jesus is there because he wants to be there. And when they drag him before the Jewish high priest, Annas and Caiaphas, and in between the pagan rulers appointed by Rome, Herod and Pilate, and when the trials are illegal and full of false witnesses and Jesus is struck against the law, when they lie about him and they bring in people to lie about him, he is there because he has chosen to be there. And when Pilate finally decides to have him flogged, scourged is the appropriate word, and they take him into the courtyard. If you don't know what scourging is without being, never mind, I am going to be graphic. They take these long strips of leather and they braid sharp objects into it. Glass, thorns, nails, bead balls. And the object isn't so much to whip the person as it is to lay the whip across them and yank violently to shred the skin on their back. See, the Jews had a rule that you could only beat a man 39 times, but Jesus wasn't beaten by the Jews. He was beaten by the Romans, and they had no such compassion. They beat him within an inch of his life. In fact, historical records tell us that more than half the men who were scourged died from the scourging alone. These bully soldiers taking turns, seeing who could draw the most blood, who could make him cry out in pain, it must have driven them nuts that he kept his mouth shut the whole time. His back shredded, blood everywhere, so weak he can barely stand, and he is there because he chose to be there. And when they begin to mock him, And they push the fake crown into his head. And they drape him in the purple robe. Hail, king of the Jews, some king you are now. When they blindfold him and play Bop the prophet. Go ahead, prophesy, tell us who hit you. Who who hit you with the club this time? I bet you can't tell us. And when they spit on him and they call him names, And they humiliate him in every way they can think of. You need to know he is there because he chose to be there. And if he wanted to, he could snap his fingers and legions of angels would appear and the whole story would be over, but he doesn't because he wants to be there. And when they strap the crossbeam to his shoulders and they march him through the streets and the people spit upon him and mock him and humiliate him and he becomes so weak that he can no longer stand up underneath the weight of the cross and he's crushed under its weight waiting on someone to help him. He's there because he chose to be there. And when they get to the top of Mount Golgotha and they drive nails through the nerves in his wrist and it shoots pain up his arms and down his back, But when they pin his heels to the cross, when his lungs begin to fill with fire because he can't breathe, when his back that has been shredded by a scourging rubs up and down on the unfinished raw wood of a cross, as he begins to suffocate and lose blood and breathe his last, he is there because he has chosen to be there. 
And when he cries out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani! Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know the answer to the question. We know why he's on that God-forsaken cross. Why he suddenly feels all alone. Why his body is breaking down as his friends abandon him and he takes on the sin of the world. We know exactly why. He's there because he chose to be there. This is not Jesus risking his life. This is not Jesus willing to suffer if necessary. This is Jesus from before the foundation of the world knowing that the cross was the end and choosing to walk the road anyway. Timothy Keller asked the question. He says, anytime we read the story of the cross, we must ask, why? What does the God of the universe have to gain by hanging on a cross? The God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The God who speaks stars into existence. The God who is all-powerful, all-knowing. What does the God of the universe have to gain by hanging on the cross? And the answer, of course, is one simple word. Us. He has to gain us. Not because he needs us. Not because God was somehow insufficient. Not because God was somehow lacking and needed a relationship to make him complete. But because he wanted you. Because he loved you. And he wanted to spend eternity with you. And he was willing to show his love in whatever means necessary. And greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So he could be with you. So he could be with me. That, my friends, is the great love of God. I began this morning by talking to you about the five love languages. And I kind of want to circle back to those and explain to you why those are so important and what in the world they have to do with the story of the cross. So, when I've done counseling with people, and I have friends who, who do this too, that's one of the first places I start. If I'm doing marriage counseling or I'm talking with a parent and a child, um, if I'm dealing with two friends who can't get along, it's one of the very first things we talk about. Because here is the single most common breakdown in relation. This is free marriage counseling for you all today, all right? It's free with admission. We tend, all of us speak our own love language. As I walked through those, some of you went, oh yeah, that's, I really enjoy when people, like I love to get hugs, or I love to get gifts. Or, like some of you resonated with those ideas. We all tend to have our own specific combination of this is the way I feel most loved. And so what happens is we tend to show love in the same way we feel loved. So if you happen to be the kind of person who feels loved through acts of service, when someone cleans your, your car for you, or someone holds a door for you, or that someone helps you carry a heavy thing, you're like, man, I really appreciate that. I feel so blessed by their willingness to serve me. You tend to then demonstrate your love in the same way. You tend to want to serve other people because that makes you feel loved, so you show it the same way you feel it. But what happens is there's this breakdown. And I'll just, I'll use one example for you. I, I have a friend. I watched this unfold. Her dad communicates love in two ways. He is a quality time person and a gift giver. That means that, that she's always had a car to drive. She's always had nice clothes to wear. Um, college is taking, uh, just blesses her with material possessions beyond belief. She has more stuff than she knows what to do with. And they do, they have all these family traditions that they, they go on vacations together and they do these things on Saturday mornings together and they eat meals together. And so in, in the dad's mind, he is showing her great love all the time. The problem is her love languages are physical touch and words of encouragement. 
And so she has spent her whole life with a dad who thought he was showing her incredible love. And what she desperately needed was him to give her a hug and tell her he was proud of her. She didn't need more clothes. She didn't need another car. She didn't need another family vacation. She needed a hug and words of encouragement. And so what happens in relationships and it happens in marriages where the husband is like, I don't know why she's mad at me. Like, I, I tell her I love her all the time. I bring chocolates home every Friday. And the wife's like, I just wanted to do the dishes. If he could just do the dishes once a month, well, we'd be okay. Um, that breakdown of, I think I'm showing you love, but you don't feel love. And what happens is we have a whole world full of people who are deeply and passionately loved, and yet they go through life thinking no one loves them. And I tell you that whole long story to get to this point. We have a God who loved you so much that though he had no need of you, he wanted you so desperately and so badly that from the very beginning of the story, he planned a history that ended with the most brutal death in the history of mankind so that someday you would love him back and spend eternity with him. We have a God who has shown us the greatest love there is possible to show, and what is remarkable to me is how easy it is for us to walk through life feeling unloved. How easy it is for us walking through life to go, God must not care about me. If God cared about me, I'd have this. If God cared about me, I'd have that. God doesn't seem to hear. Do you understand? He died for you. He didn't have to. Nobody made him. There's not a force strong enough in the world to nail him to that cross unless he wanted to be there. But greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And so Jesus Christ, the Son of God, chose the cross so that someday you would have the chance to choose him. The love of God is really that simple. You never, ever, ever need to walk through this life wondering if someone loves you or not. Because the answer is absolutely with every fiber of his being, the God that we serve loves you. Francis Chan has this incredible quote. He wrote a book probably a decade ago called Crazy Love. And in that book he says, the great irony of the world is that we serve a God who does not need us and yet desperately wants us. And far too often, those of us who desperately need him don't want him. We serve a God who does not need us and yet desperately wants us. And yet far too often, those of us who desperately need him simply don't want him. And so we're going to sing this invitation song this morning, softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. If you need to experience the love of Christ for the first time or for the hundredth time because you've wandered away, we invite you to come as we stand and sing our invitation song this morning. Why don't you join me as we sing?